Welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Corva. Today, we are joined by Laura N. Petito. Professor Laura N. Petito, a cognitive neuroscientist, is the co-principal investigator and science director of the National Science Foundation's Science of Learning Center, Visual Language and Visual Learning, VL2, at Gallaudet University. She is also a professor in the Department of Psychology at Gallaudet, an affiliate professor in the Department of Psychology at Georgetown University, and the scientific director of her own Brain and Language Laboratory for Neuroimaging. She is known for her scientific discoveries concerning language and its neural representation in the human brain, how young children acquire language, the shared signed and spoken language processing sites and systems in the human brain, the bilingual brain, and the reading brain. I hope you enjoyed this episode. The Dare to Know podcast is now also available on iTunes and Spotify. Please check out the links in the description below. Professor Petito, welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. My yeah, thank, honor. yeah, thank you so much for being. I really appreciate uh, your time. So maybe uh, to get started, it would be really great if you could tell us a little bit about your background. Um, how did you get interested in the work of Noam Chomsky? Yes, um, there are several factors that guided my interest. Um, one has to do with uh, his domain of study: uh, the theory of mind, the theory of language, the philosophy of. Uh, mind and language, uh, the nature of thought. And um, it is impossible for anyone uh, to have been alive in those years in the mid 70s to not have heard of Noam Chomsky. And it's beyond that, not to have encountered him in just virtually everything we did. I mean, he was in our philosophy textbooks, our psychology textbooks, our anthropology textbooks, our linguistics textbooks. He was in our architecture textbooks. He was in, he was in uh, treaties on dance and the structural essence, essential components, the elementary structures of dance um, from which all the variations uh, emerge. Um, he was um, in contemporary thought, he was alive and um, uh, not only, you know, nationally, not only at MIT and, you know, Boston and New York City, but it was global. I have colleagues all over the world, Hong Kong, South Africa, um, my husband's from Ireland, um, people all over the world in that period of time. Uh, came into life and on the stage of learning with Noam Chomsky. So that's one factor. I must say that that actually has never changed. Uh, it is, has persisted throughout all time. My own children, their textbooks across many different disciplines have him. He's made pioneering contributions that are essential to the nature of what it means to be human. But beyond that, um, there was this wonderful convergence of two other factors. Uh, it con uh, my introduction to him also converged with the fact that I was personally uh, ha uh, passionately interested in the origins of thought, the nature of mind, and also um, the variety of thought formats that we have. We think through many ways. We have uh, tactile, vision, auditory, uh, smell, touch, but the quintessential thought format is language. And so I naturally gravitated to wanting to understand the nature of language. And so that brought me to my readings of him. Then uh, I, my third uh, influence, my third introduction to him was, had to do with my day job. I was a, um, a individual on a research project at Columbia University that was attempting to teach sign language to an infant chimpanzee named Nim Chimsky, affectionately named after Noam Chomsky. And um, the looming questions that we were asking on this project had to do with fundamental uh, theories and articulations of answers that Noam Chomsky was espousing at the time. Uh, there was a human question of what makes 
all species different? Are we different? What do we share with other animals? What is unique to our species? And Noam answered the question with way, in ways that were testable and in ways that the ex external world could evaluate. It also was an explosive time because there had been a long standing uh, tradition of behaviorism uh, in which and they too asked, uh, what is it that makes us special? And is there anything special about language? And there was a different answer. The answer was that it was primarily learned language, learned from environmental input. And so there was this electric historical time in which there were two primar primary burning positions and questions and two very different answers. And so the goal, um, a challenge was to ask that, well, if humans are uh, special, then aspects of human language should be unteachable and unlearnable. Yep. But if we share human language in all of its complexity and all of its beauty with 100% with other animals, yep. then in principle, we should be able to teach our closest relative, uh, evolutionarily yep. speaking, mm -hmm. we should be able to set up natural contexts within which we can facilitate their learning of language. So. There was a thrilling moment in history. We understood very well where we stood. Uh, we understood the importance of the question. And it was um, a, quite a global excitement in uh, asking and answering what makes our species special or different or not. So, yes, yeah. um, so my, you know, my, so my, my introduction to Noam mm -hmm. began in this trilogy of he was the looming leading feature in intellectual thought on language. I was fascinated in language, and I was on a language experimental project, and uh, that three-way convergence. Uh, launched my uh, introduction to him. Uh, we also uh, um, began uh, communications and I later, later studied with him. And I, I mentioned that only to uh, emphasize that the connection with Noam and the inspiration from his brilliant theories and um, pioneering hypotheses was going to stay with me in my own science for the rest of my career. It was going to uh, you know, launch questions and uh, ways of evaluating them uh, in very um, interesting and new ways to give answers that um, eventually in time brought us to understand that his uh, early hypotheses that he did largely with pen and paper and the power of the magnificent power of his mind were in many ways correct and um, in thrilling ways that teach us about what it means to have a distinctively human mind. No, that's really fascinating. Thank you for setting sort of the context uh, for this. And I would be also really interested to understand how uh, Chomsky contributed to the architecture from the curriculum perspective. I haven't heard that, but that's also... <laughs> Uh, very tangibly. I mean, mm -hmm. just you can you know, take this out, but um, uh, there was uh, his ideas were very concretely embraced by aspects of architectural theory. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Eisenman embraced the notion that a building is um, formed from an essential small finite set of units from which the building can generate uh, in a generative way the infinite number of buildings that we build and that the core syntax of a building is a essential fundamental element. That's just a very brief summary of the way 
architects incorporated chomsky and ideas of elementary structures and generativity into something like architecture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Same thing with dance, that there are constraints on aspects of the types of movements that the human body can make from which uh, the infinite variety of dance is created. Mm -hmm. uh, we also see that in the biological world and explanations of viruses, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a toolkit of um, defenses that we have uh, against viruses. And when a new virus comes in, we draw from that toolkit to generate an attack and solution on this novel intruder. Mm -hmm. So the analogies to Chomsky uh, began to be embraced in very disparate disciplines in ways that um, were powerful and tantalizing. Uh, clearly, he had happened upon, he had created, not by accident, an insight into the organization of biological life and the generativity in biological life that had a, a huge explanatory mm -hmm. uh, power. And so because of that began to be embraced in different disciplines. It wasn't just a co cookie cutter copying of his ideas mm -hmm. or a cookie cutter mentioning of ideas. Mm -hmm. It was the actual use of his core elements in which by which he explained language into these other disciplines in where they used it as explanatory mechanisms for their own discipline. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it was um, uh, I mean, that's quite an influence. Yes, yes. Uh, we mere mortals should only have such an influence. And um, whether he was embraced or rejected, uh, all disciplines pretty much stood up and had something to say yeah. uh, mm -hmm. about uh, to him. And mm -hmm. that in itself is um, an incredible contribution uh, to the nature of our species. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's amazing. That reminds me like, yeah, you have to, for sure, like you can disagree or agree, but you have to for sure deal with the ideas. And that's a sign of a great uh, thinker. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's certainly true. So like sort of moving on uh, uh, a little bit. So, uh, you know, today we're going to talk in particular about an article uh, that you wrote in uh, the Ch Chomsky Cambridge campaign of 2015 uh, titled How the Brain Begets Language. But, you know, this article is covering a lot of ground, uh, decades of research. Uh, so we'll try to unpack, unpack uh, as much as we can uh, uh, during this uh, conversation. Um, but maybe to just uh, start off, and you already alluded to it, uh, your uh, project with, uh, uh, you know, Nim Chomsky, uh, you know, uh, can you maybe just introduce this project, uh, provide a little bit of context that would be really helpful? Yes, so um, in uh, Chomsky's theorizing, he suggested that aspects of human language were unique to the species. Well, um, as any good scientist would proceed, um, one must test that hypothesis. And this was a very uh, daring test. Um, rather than uh, hypothesize or infer um, whether language is special to the species and unique to the human brain, um, a team of people uh, at, in different parts of the United States set out to test that. And um, uh, it was a very serious question that was not only a scientific question, but the human question. What, I mean, um, what do we share with other animals? This is something that all of us ask. You sit at the table with your dog and you look across as you're drinking your coffee and you say, gee, what do you want? What are you thinking about? How do you see the world from down there? Um, what do you feel? What do you know? And, and so that was a part of the human question. Um, uh, it, then there was the um, very exciting ideas that um, uh, if you wanted to study whether aspects of language were part of our biological makeup, uh, that it should act in certain ways. Uh, we learned from Eric Lennenberg, who wrote the famous Biological Foundations of Language in 1967, that, la that complex behaviors proceed along a specific regular maturational time course, despite varying environments. 
that if there are interruptions somehow in the path of that development that the species overcomes it with um, compensatory processes, but still eventually uh, achieves a target state. So we had a blueprint of the types of evidence we'd be looking for in another species like a chimpanzee. And we had Chomsky's hypotheses about what makes us special. Mm -hmm. And so, and we had the human emotional passionate curiosity of the nature of mind of animals and the uh, our our brethren who walk the, this planet and that converged onto a project called this was project nim chimsky uh, it was as i said named affectionately after noam chomsky and what was unique about the project is we had the representative theories of the time that were burning through society mm -hmm. Um, Herb Terrace was a student of B.F. Skinner mm -hmm. at Harvard, and Tom Bever was a former student of Noam Chomsky at MIT. And these two uh, project heads were came together to ask this question in a way that was hoped to be as open and fair and inclusive of the controversial positions of the time. So. Um, uh, I just to, just to say to situate you, um, the question about language in apes uh, began very early, it, uh, a hundred years before, uh, when the turn of the century researchers attempted to teach uh, uh, spoken language chimpanzees, Russian being most notable, German, etc. Um, they did not succeed. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Lieberman in the 50s uh, articulated aspects of the vocal tract that were incapable of producing speech in chimpanzees. And so in 1963, um, in, in the early 60s, uh, Alan and Beatrice Gardner attempted to teach sign language <laughs> to infant chimpanzees. And the sign language itself uh, these are full, fully expressive natural languages. And the issue with that project is that it was very difficult to evaluate the claims. The claims were grandiose, the claims were enormous, that apes have uh, better language acquisition than human children at age three. Um, and they were so grand, and yet there was nothing to evaluate Evaluate. Well, what is this based on? How mm -hmm. do we know? Do you have videotapes? Do you have mm -hmm. journal entries? Do you have long books? None of which were available. So the mm -hmm. enter Nim Chimsky as the first study in the history of science to ask in a way in which the world can evaluate with us the data. We whether it's, whether our question was, is human language entirely teachable or learnable through environmental input, as mm -hmm. the behaviorist would suggest, or were there aspects of human language that would resist instruction, that couldn't just be wholesale learned? And that's a very exciting part of the question, because it would help us identify that secret of what it means to have a human mind. This was the promise that somehow we would see what we shared with other animals, that point in the Venn diagram that overlaps where we, you know, that electric moment where the two figures uh, touch in Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. It's, we would find that moment, that electric moment that informed us about uh, the uniqueness of, human, of the human species and what we shared with other animals. So that's the project. Um, uh, I am, uh, it was a unique project and I'm unique in uh, the history of these projects because I actually uh, was with uh, Nim steadily in his life since he was about three weeks old. Uh, there were other caretakers, but um, contrary to documentary portrayals, <laughs> um, I was the um, consistent force in his life over his uh, 
over four months before he was sent to the Norman Oklahoma primate colony. So he had uh, a loving and steady uh, a language learning environment. Uh, I also should say that um, during that time we had um, much contact with Noam Chomsky who um, was was interested in the project. This wasn't, uh, he never framed this as uh, uh, being disinteresting, or disinterest, he wasn't disinterested. He did never framed it as being an uninteresting scientific question. He appre we all appreciated the enormity of these uh, uh, projects, how uh, challenging, challenging they were, how unique they were. In fact, at the time they were called the grand experiment. Mm. Um, you know of the forbidden experiment, those experiments in nature that you would never dare to do, but nature unfortunately presents us with these children, for example, the wild boy of Avignon, mm. who came, who was ostensibly raised by, in the, in the forest, on his own, interacting with animals, and then discovered at a late age of around 11 or 12. So um, uh, this wasn't the forbidden experiment, this was the grand experiment. The animals were very rare. This was a very, they were very um, difficult to uh, uh, be with. Um, I, uh, as an aside, these are extremely dangerous animals. Uh, this is not the adorable, cute little animal that you see in their Oshkosh Bagosh overalls mm -hmm. that um, they didn't just differ in the nature of their language, they differed in the entire complex of being this mm -hmm. social organization, the emotional organization, their linguistic uh, knowledge, um, their linguistic expression. So they differed on a variety of levels and one of them, socially was that humans did not accrue any points because you were the person who fed it and gave it access to free play mm -hmm. and you were with them every day of their lives. There were still things that one could do that would cause the animal to turn around and attack to kill. Mm. Uh, and they are innocuous things to us. I mean, raising my body too quickly and going to reach for something and showing my back would uh, cause, cause the chimp to go into a fixed action pattern whereby he would have the erection, the bearing of the teeth, the hoot, the lunge, the contact, the rip, the tear, and the release. And it didn't matter that I was his surrogate mother, <laughs> you know, uh, his primary teacher, and I lived with him. Uh, these were very dangerous animals. So these projects were difficult and not going to be a dime a dozen. We all realized the uh, singularity of these projects and how um, uh, pr special they were. And so Noam was very, you know, Chomsky was very uh, attentive, watching the results, aware of the analyses, um, uh, and, um, you know, eager to understand the nature of the findings and open. And that openness uh, propelled and inspired us to uh, keep going, because as I said, these were very hard projects to do. It's very rare that you have um, a research subject that could kill you. Uh, and so um, uh, these, could, these projects can never ever be done again in, uh, in contemporary science. There are uh, rules about it and protection of the students and the workers and protection of the community, et cetera, and protection of the animals, rightfully so. Mm -hmm. So um, we asked that question. And so um, a primary question, as I mentioned, was, are, is there some, are we special? Is there something yeah. unique about human language? Mm -hmm. And when I left the project, it definitive, there was a definitive answer. Mm -hmm. We were, we, <clears throat> There was no question that there was a rich communication, rich emotional uh, landscape of a chimpanzee, uh, memory, uh, sequential and serial knowledge, 
um, learning capacity. There was an impressive amount of cognitive capacities that these apes had. Mm -hmm. In fact, they were so intelligent, their failure to learn key aspects of human mm -hmm. language part of what stunned us. Uh, why didn't they learn this? I mean, if you add up the cognitive capacities that the chimpanzee had, you put it on a list, you draw the line, ergo, we'd get language if it was our species. But for him, aspects of human language were completely unachievable, unattainable. And so the tantalizing question was, why? So uh, to summarize, the CHIM projects answered a fundamental question that Noam Chomsky had raised. He asked, are we unique in our language capacities? Is our species unique? He hypothesized that we were unique. Our cross-species work taught us he was correct there are aspects of human language that are special to our species. Human language is special. That was a major conclusion of the eight projects. And it is a, it, these are very controversial projects. Everybody is you know, honest and earnest and wants to find the answer. People differ in the interpretation of what they see, but nobody challenges what they see. We all see that aspects of human language are not learnable or teachable to a chimpanzee. Nobody disagrees with that. So even if you're the most avid apes have language, yeah. oh, oh yes, but there's no phonology. Oh, oh yes, but there's no syntax. Oh, 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 oh yeah, well, like, yes, of course there's no morphology. You know what I mean? There's no, no matter how much you say, yes, they have language, all parties on whatever end of the fence, side of the fence you're on agree, well, it's not exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not negative. Mm -hmm. That's really exciting and positive. These projects were spectacularly successful. Mm -hmm. Every research, every CHIM project was successful because they taught us that there's something about human language that's special. Mm -hmm. And so that raised the next generation of questions. Mm -hmm. And it, it closed one question. Noam Chomsky was right about this bold hypothesis that this aspects of human language that are special, he was right. We showed with cross-species work, there are resistant parts of human language they couldn't learn. However, it raised a new question. What is special about human language? What is it? At the time and it then, even persistent into today, the fundamental answer was human language is special because we talk. We speak, we process sound, we have reception for sound, we produce it, we receive it. It is, it is sound and the processing of speech that makes it special. But that raised some prima facie problems. Yep. What were we doing with these chimps? We weren't talking. We were teaching them sign language. We were teaching them a language that doesn't use sign, that doesn't use sound. We were teaching them a language that if language were in their brain and they had a linguistic capacity, it should have outed itself on their hands. We thought of a way to trick the brain and bypass the mouth to get into the mouth via the hands. We gave them every opportunity to reveal to us the contents of their mind by outing it through the hands. Okay, they didn't have access to the tongue and the mouth muscles and the articulatory power of the human tongue in the oral facial cavity. Fine, let's bypass it. Strip away the mouth, give them the hands, out pops, out should pop language. So it, even then, the question 
arose no that it can't be speech is special but that wasn't enough for the world we live in and so that then set off a research trajectory that was then going to guide the next 40 years of scientific inquiry Oh, that's very fascinating. Yeah, so thank you for you know setting out the project, and it sounds like a very you know fascinating scientific journey, but probably also a personal journey uh, for you to be on this project and you know all eyes on uh, this project and what was coming out. And maybe diving in, and you already shared some of uh, the findings uh, you know of the project itself, but maybe zooming in on on one uh, concrete example uh, in the case of uh, semantics or meaning. Uh, uh, you know, you specifically talk about the example of. Uh, you know, learning the word apple towards uh, a chimp. So, you know, what were some of the issues? What were the observations there? How is that different? There's still a debate going on regarding referential semantics. Like, are there these direct relationships between word and the world? How can we sort of understand that discussion, but also, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, the case of uh, semantics, uh, understanding like uh, words like apple, etc., cetera, uh, in this context? Yes. All right. So um, when we, uh, you have to, First, understand the method of attribution. Mm -hmm. The ape would be uh, trained in signs and in a natural way in a conversational social interaction of the world that would involve semantic elaborations. Yes, that's a bottle. You like your bottle. Would you like your bottle? The kind of normal expansions that we do with language. And then we would study the nature of his communicative interactions with us. And that meant we would see the, his hand movements, his signs, and um, because of uh, the need to harness those signs that we'd see that would be you know, coming at us a mile a minute, they would be harnessed by glossing them with an English word, the most approximate word. This is a universal method. We do this with children. Young children do not begin with perfectly articulated words. They begin with phonologically imperfect forms, approximations. They have proto words, et cetera. They, have, you know, they don't have a mature phonological inventory, and so they're hitting approximations of a word. But yet we look at the context, we look at what came before and after, and we then attach a word to stand for what that child meant there. So the child may say, bada, to mean bottle. And so we would put the phonetic transcription of what they actually produced, and then we would put a comparable gloss that it bottled. And so those methods that were used with uh, studying children's language had to be used in studying chimp language, because if we're going to say that chimpanzees are learning language better than children, then we would compare how does a child learn language and how did he learn language. And we, um, good scientists would use similar methods. If he waves his hand, we would attempt to understand what the phonological target might have been and in the context discern what the likely referent was. So we gloss, so one key thing is we would gloss the productions. Then as you do with all languages, we then analyze the sequence of the productions. You, you're looking for a syntax. Mm -hmm. You're looking for a syntactic patterning. And one of the things we found with regard to syntax is something that you would never see in the developmental trajectory of a child at any point in human development. So if you take the continuum of language acquisition in children and you try to take the chimpanzee's behavior and place it on that continuum, there's no match. Mm -hmm. So what the chimp did is to take, uh, to use pretty reliably about a small core of about 10 signs. These signs, very interestingly, required tens of thousands of tri trials of training for it to be, become stable. Mm -hmm. And absolutely no uh, uh, 
uh, suspension of the trainings because unlike a human child, if you fail to uh, maintain the training of the chimp signs for particular reference, it would extinguish to zero as if they never saw it in three days. Mm. So um, uh, learning is very different in chimps as well. But let's just uh, go with the syntax. So we look at the string of the uh, in, uh, forms and we find that the chimpanzee used about a core component of 10 signs. Mm -hmm. 10 signs as a nucleus. And they were primary reinforcers. Again, semantically, there's no point in a child's development where they only say, um, uh, ask for food reinforcement or food uh, um, or stimulation like tickle. Uh, nim, eat, more, more, eat, nim, banana, nim, eat, apple, nim, eat. So those 10 core signs, as time progressed, rather than the sentences becoming more and more complex, just became additive strings tacked on. So Look, he had the 10 common signs, most frequent signs. Now he's going to move from two sign combinations, nim more, to three word combinations. Superficially, that's what children do. However, that next word was not a novel word, a word that elaborated semantically on this two word utterance but he reached back into his core set of 10 signs and he would add it on as an additive cumulative list. There was no internal embellishment in complexity. It was just the two sign predilections, nim more, more nim, eat more, uh, banana more, plus another sign from the 10 common signs tacked on. It was a string, a concatenation. It was not an embellishment of complexity of the syntactic utterance. It was a laundry list of words. And the list would be presented irrespective of the semantic match with the context. So if I held up a, a watch that he thought was attractive and wanted it, of course he wanted it, he would out nim more, nim more banana, banana nim more, banana orange nim more, banana apple nim more. It would be the two sign utterance plus one of the 10 tacked on, even though there was no relationship with watch. Would you please give me the watch? It was just this um, word salad that yeah. came out in a concatenation of signs hmm. that, okay, so by contrast, a human child might learn mommy sock. A famous example in child language by Lois Bloom is mommy sock. And then when the child is maturing in the, over the maturation of human language, the child doesn't say mommy sock more. It will, that two sign utterance, that two word utterance becomes imbued and embellished with morphological enrichment. It becomes mommy sock, mm -hmm. the possessive marker, the morphological marker that marks ownership and possession, mommy sucks. So the children do not learn in what's called a flat mean length of utterance. They learn in additional complexity that's imbued and embedded and nested in their nascent expressions. So it's not just a concatenation of mommy suck, bed, shoe, feeling light. No, 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 no. It's not every word that they own in that moment in time. It is the canonical two word utterance with morphological enrichment. So the chimpanzee had what we called a flat 
mean length of an utterance. It never, it got morphologically enriched. It, got, it was instead a concatenation of free form signs that were thrown in and only from a small set of 10 signs. So those beautiful vocabulary curves you see with 178 signs, no, 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 no. They didn't actively know those signs. That's the signs that we were able to have them hit a production criteria. And then once the training was relinquished, it fell down to zero. If you couldn't practice wristwatch every day, that would fall off the, that would fall away. And again, what was actively in the chimp's life, banana apple would be the core 10 signs. You have to understand that never changed over time. Mm -hmm. So five years later, he was still nim more apple banana, nim more apple banana to get a soccer ball. Mm, yeah. Okay. You understand? Yeah. It never changed. It was a flat, mean length utterance. It didn't change morphologically, and the syntactic organization didn't change. It's not that he, this is very interesting. It's not that he had no syntax, mm -hmm. he had stable two word. Yeah preferences in the order in which he would produce his strings. But what's fascinating is to see the cliff he came to and where he fell off. Therein lies the difference between communication and chimp mind and human mind and language. That was the key. Now with regard, so let me get to your important question about semantics. Notice in those first analyses, the big science paper that came out in 1979, all we had to grab on is what lent itself most, uh, av what's most available to us was to analyze those, the syntax, mm -hmm. the glosses that captured his hand moving wildly in space to put it on paper and to analyze it for syntactic regularities and for morphological regularities. And I just summarized that. Yep. With a hope and a prayer, we had to just assume that what we put down as the gloss was in fact the meaning he intended and that that meaning was identical to meaning in our head. Yep. Several years later, it took years to do these analyses. My colleague and I, Mark Seidenberg, began analyzing the in in with uh, uh, the rigor that it needed, the nature of those glosses, what we characterize as banana, as nim, as more, as all the lexicon that we attributed to him, did it have the meaning? that they would have for us. Now, again, this is not chauvinistic. We were interested in what was, this is an other minds problem. What did he know when he yeah. used banana? Mm -hmm. What did he know? It wasn't to prove it was different. It was, no, it's the reverse. It's, you know, sitting at the knee in adoration of him. What is it that you know? Mm -hmm. And what do you know when you use banana? What, what are you saying to us? Mm -hmm. And then we asked, where is that Venn diagram? Where is the overlap? To what extent is it like us or not? Um, just to understand the secrets of human mentation, but not to put down the ape. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. I want you to know these apes were loved by everyone who ever came in contact with them. How could you not? I mean, you love your dog, you're certainly going to love your chimp. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I mean? It's like we're human and we love to anthropomorphize and make, mm -hmm. we love to over attribute. And mm -hmm. so, um, we sat at his knee, we, we were at his beck and call. So these were positive approaches yeah. to understand the other minds problem. What do you know? So how do you, it's obvious, you know, it's a, as you know, it's a very hard problem. How do I know what you know? Um, how do I know when you use the word pen that, and I use the word pen that we are, we share a semantic space. Um, <clears throat> And uh, you know, one thing 
uh, you also know about words is that um, a large portion of our words do not index literally a referent in the world. When I say the word pen, all I am saying is that this object is true of the class of kind pen in my head. I am, I, I am implicitly making an attribution of its, of its class membership. Mm -hmm. This pen belongs to the class of kind pen. And um, in other words, our, this, uh, this permits, we have our meanings are coordinate, coordinated along class or kind, mm -hmm. and we um, uh, implicitly share that, your brain and my brain, which can overlook accents and overlook language experience and, and see to the essence of the reference involved pen. Oh, you must be referring, referring to the pen that yeah. I use. And we will assume we have shared categories. Yeah. All right. And um, one of the things we do in child language to understand how a child knows the meaning of a word mm -hmm. is we do just that. We look at thousands and thousands of the child's usage of a form of a word like cup or yeah. um, blanket. And we look at the child's production and the range of reference over which the child applies that word. Yeah then we go the other way. We look at the range of reference and we go back and see, does the usage and the multiple contexts allow us to infer that the child's usage and meaning co coheres along kind boundaries? And what we found in child language, which is very, very fascinating, is that children don't come into the world entertaining all hypotheses about the meaning of a word. Mm -hmm. So when you know the precocious 11 month old baby is in its crib and mom goes to the refrigerator and says, Billy, would you like some juice? While she's opening the refrigerator, pulling out the pitcher of orange juice, taking his glass and pouring it into the glass and putting it down on the high chair, human children don't look at this complex of snapshot of a potentially infinite number of meanings. Mm -hmm. I mean, just yep. think about mm -hmm. it. Yep. Juice could mean the act of going to the refrigerator. It could mean the refrigerator. Juice could mean the pitcher. Yep. Juice could mean the yep. act of pouring. Mm -hmm. Juice could mean the liquid in the glass. Juice could mean the tabletop. Or it could mean this incredible liquid in, that's actually in the glass. Yep. So human children come into this world constrained in the hypotheses that they entertain about the meaning of the words. They don't look at this. This is like the coin's rabbit uh, yeah. problem, right? Uh, walking through the forest, a guide says that's a rabbit in their language and you look at it and it could be the it could be the whiskers it could be the tail but somehow we assume it means the whole object yeah mm -hmm. but if we already have a word for the whole object that rules out the whole object attribution and then that allows us to look more deeply oh it must be the whisk whiskers so this is the type of analysis we did we um, understood basic essential components of human language acquisition and how the child's hypotheses about the meanings of words are constrained let me just acknowledge that there's wild controversy in the field about from whence these constraints come. Why do or the constraints exist? Are they given through perception? Are they ostension, extension, in, intention? Uh, my own research has suggested answers, but what, again, the facts of acquisition are not controversial. Why they happen is controversial. We all agree that children in seeing these novel contexts and they're offered a, a word for a possible and non-existing object, think that the new label stands for the whole thing. Yep. It's constrained along kind of objects, 
kinds of events, kinds of locations, kinds of possessions. That's fascinating about the human mind. Chimpanzee semantics. I'm going to, I'm answering your question yes, now. Yes, yes. I mean, you need to understand what the humans do before you can see what the chimp did and what it would mean. And so that you can con come to the same conclusion about what it means. Again, it's not yeah. uninteresting, it's different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so you hold up the, mom goes through that sequence with the orange juice and children's first 11 month old precocious, precocious 11 month old goes to somehow assumes it's the liquid in the glass. Okay. Now we're gonna do the same analysis with chimpanzees. We're gonna look at the nature of their manual productions, their signs. We're gonna look at the range of reference over which they use those signs. And then we're going to do the analysis. Was there anything cohered about the range of reference over which they use the signs. And similarly, going back analysis of those different contexts within which they used it, was that cohering along any type of implicit organization or concepts, if you will. Mm -hmm. And what we found that the chimpanzee, and this is an analysis we did of all the existing chimpanzee projects, irrespective of the learning medium, be it uh, computer AI boards or uh, sign language or chips. It didn't matter what the method was, sign language, it didn't matter what the method was. What we saw is that if you take their signs and you, you look at it at the range of reference it and back analysis, to the context, to the nature of the signs that were stably associated with them, the chimpanzees' behaviors were not cohered along kind boundaries. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, this is fascinating. That means when Nim used the word apple, he used it for the act of walking to the part of the room where the jar was kept that had the apple. He used it for the event of us opening the jar. He used it for us to get the object in the jar, the apple. He then used it for apple. He used it to eat the, to want to eat the apple. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there was no coherence along concept kind boundaries. It wasn't, he never in a human child's trajectory, we don't see them violating kinds of mm -hmm. actions or events mm -hmm. or kinds of objects. These basic categories, this basic division in the yeah. world, we see in children, even children who are incited. It mm -hmm. doesn't just come from vision. It, it's not simply a perceptual categorization problem. It is a human mind brain concept that we hold when we are born. Mm -hmm. And it gets filled with instances and exemplars. But we enter the world with a little bit of a booster rocket in the conceptual categories of kinds of events, actions, kinds of objects, which are nouns. You know, the world gives us and our brain supports yep. these basic cuts. So let me tell you what the ape was doing. It's fascinating. There is nothing uninteresting about what the chimp did. Using apple for the activity, the action of going to the jar, for the action of opening the jar, for the action of reaching, for the action of getting, for the object itself, and for the eating. What's he doing? He has a component of naming. Yep. He has associative learning. Mm -hmm. yep. That is a component that is interesting. Mm -hmm. We know we share that with other animals. Mm -hmm. The capacity to associate, the compass. So, in a way, he is taking a complex of snapshot 
of everything associated with Apple. Mm -hmm. That's not uninteresting. Mm -hmm. Tantalizing, thrilling thing is the human mind went another step. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hierarchically organized concepts and relations among concepts. I just don't manipulate pen and glasses. I manipulate the categories abstract in my head that are comprised. So I can, you can tell me, you can show me a chair and then you can take trash bin and come into my room because there's no other chairs turn it upside down and sit on it mm -hmm. and you can i can say yeah sit on come sit on that chair as a chair you know and we can both understand that you were using the trash can as a chair and we can tolerate but well, pull your chair over here a little bit more you wouldn't correct me necessarily you would understand that i've expanded my concept to include different exemplars of this superordinate class or kind that we have and we manipulate in our mind so Therein lies a secret of human mentation mm -hmm. it's not to diss the ape it was fascinating Fascinated, fascinating where the overlap was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have association. We need it to learn new language. I need it to have been exposed to English and French. Mm -hmm. I needed that. Yeah. And mm -hmm. to learn. I learning and association is part of the capacity to learn language, but it's not enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The contribution of the semantic architecture yeah. and very importantly, the contribution of the syntactic patterning that is at the nucleus of language structure mm -hmm. is something that is unique to our species and something that teaches us about the secrets of the human mind and mentation. These projects were totally successful. Mm -hmm. Successful to raise our respect of them and to raise our understanding of where the two of us reach across yep. the evolutionary abyss and connect and where we just broke off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and Oh my God, they were totally informative in the history of our species and, and kept every promise that we made in the grant proposals mm -hmm. about. And again, uh, what they consistently demonstrated it is that Noam Chomsky's prophetic hypothesizing and theory and um, argumentation on the power of deduction in addition to induction in the human language acquisition was going to be a core critical component that makes language unique and distinct and through this cross species work we were able to discover he was absolutely correct this is this is fascinating and and, and kind of going beyond uh, these studies and these findings so your research in uh, early sign language acquisition maybe we can dive into that uh, another huge topic so uh, maybe you could just uh, explain you know why is this such a clear window into the biological foundations of all human language now we identified that as really something special there to investigate um so yeah it would be great if you uh, could elaborate on that exactly it's a very uh, the next steps of this science and human question about ape language capacity, it didn't stop with the fact that we discovered that aspects of human language were special. It, it raised new questions and the new question was, well, what is special? Okay, we agree there is something special special, what is it? The field uh, universally identified that what was special was our capacity to speak. But when I was with Nim, that seemed prima facie ridiculous because 
we gave Nim a way to bypass his inability to speak. We gave him sign language. We weren't teaching him to talk. We were yeah. teaching yeah. him a silent language. So if he had language in his mind, in his brain, he should have been able to out it onto the hands and reveal human language in all its glory through his fingertips as opposed to his tongue. And the reason I challenge the field's view is because in my course of working with Nim, I began to look at the acquisition of profoundly deaf children's acquisition of sign language. And it was daunting to see that the children achieved each and every maturational milestone that we have attributed to speech acquisition in sign. And let me step back and tell you what I mean. Um, it is well known that children who require spoken language hit a variety of core maturational milestones in language acquisition universally on the same timetable across all the world and irrespective of the complexity or morphological syntactic organization of the target language. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what the target language typology is, the human species early in life starts out with a similar maturational timetable. They begin to babble around six to 10 months, then it evolves into a first word around 12 months, it evolves into first two words around 18 months, it evolves into morphological embellishments around 24 months that is further elaborated into comp more complex syntax. We have seen this across the world, again, irrespective of the complexity of the target language. Why did that, why do we see that? The answer by the field was easy. That reflects the maturation of the orofacial region and the brain's motor strip control over the orofacial region to produce language easy. That reflects the maturation of the auditory system to perceive and decode the sound stream of language. So the answer to why human language progresses the way it does was situated in the human capacity to produce sound and to perceive sound. Mm -hmm. so now we have an experiment in nature. Let's take the brain, strip away speech, strip away sound, and give it the hands. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that profoundly deaf children acquiring language in sign language achieve every single solitary milestone on the identical maturational timetable. So the overall timetable is the same. Mm -hmm. sign Children exposed to sign language begin their first babbling around six months. They begin their first production of the first sign around 12 months. They combine their first two sign sentences at 18 months. They make their gorgeous morphological enriched embellished forms around 24 months and the syntactic complexity in increases. They make the same type of errors children make in early language acquisition where they over regularize the language and produce errors that overextend anything they could have ever heard. No adult who signs would make those kinds of grammatical errors, but these children make the errors parallel with spoken language acquisition. So there we immediately have a challenge to the hypothesis that speech is the driving motor of human language acquisition. So it can't be, we can rule, we, can, we have evidence against the hypothesis that the acquisition of sound production and sound reception is the motor driving human language acquisition. Because we've taken, we've done the experiment, we've stripped the human being of speech and sound, and what we see is they acquire the identical milestones in language. Now let's just throw the dice a little bit more. Let's take a bilingual child. 
a child who's being exposed in a bilingual household. Uh, mother signs uh, a American Sign Language and father speaks. There, and then you have a child who's born, and this is a hearing child. So you, uh, one hypothesis, if speech is special and primary, that child should turn away from the sign input, even if it's the mother and glean any morsel of sound that it could get. You may see an asynchrony in their achievement of the maturational milestones. They may favor speech, hit every milestone in speech, and sign language might lag behind or be different in some very clear way. These children, if speech is privileged may turn again from the sign and show us asynchronies in their acquisition of the milestones in spoken language. And what we find is these children achieve each and every milestone equally, identically in sign language and spoken language. There is no preference for speech. There is no asyn asynchrony in the maturation of the language. There's no asynchrony in the achievement of the timing milestones. And they have been compared as control groups to 15 different bilingual language pairings. 15, hearing children learning spoken language bilingual contests, English, Spanish, French, English, Russian, Spanish, Russian, English, all different Chinese, English, 15 different pairs of bilingual hearing children learning languages. And the reason you pair them is because you want to vary the typological complexity and organization of the target language. Mm -hmm. So you have highly inflected language like Chinese, and you have a relatively naked inflected language like English. And so you're, you're trying to pith the different language, target language typologies and see if that influences. The reason is that American Sign Language, sign language are highly, highly inflected languages. And they have you know, fusional and agglutinative morphologies, very similar to the uh, uh, highly inflected languages and spoken language families. They're different from the typology of English. So maybe uh, that might have contributed to the acquisition. No, they're equal and they're equal to other bilingual children. And there's no time in development where that hearing child turns from sign and favors speech. If it was, again, phylogenetically privileged and speech yeah. was um, uh, the predominant mechanism that's driving language and that the human child is looking for sound, we should have seen it tripped up in that development. We don't see it. Mm -hmm. So briefly, having seen that the overall maturational timetable is the same, we then took the beacon and now we're going to shine it down in the earliest entry of human language acquisition. This is the mm -hmm. part of language acquisition that is universally understood, agreed upon, uncontroversial, that when a young baby around uh, six months, it, it begins early at four months, but around six months, we get that gorgeous, um, canonical, babbling consonant vowel form that at that everyone agrees that that's behavior that's related to language and the process of language acquisition not controversial. People argue about its content. They argue about um, uh, the extent to which it's laid, related to language structure or language uh, production mechanisms. But everyone agrees in early babbling, it's linguistic behavior. Mm -hmm. um, and the answer to why does it happen, the classic answer is that it reflects the motor strips increasing control over the oral facial region. That when a baby is born, its, uh, its um, vocal tract is at an angle like a dog. Mm -hmm. Around four to six months, the vocal tract goes into right angles and it permits the jaw to drop. Jaw, jaw, jaw. So we get this phonation of air, stop, air, stop. 
as a consonant vowel, consonant vowel alternation, and that many have argued that's just an artifact of the production mechanisms for producing babbling. Ba, 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 da, 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 da. And that um, language isn't special, that motor development and the motor infrastructure for producing language is what's central. So Chomsky is wrong in this view. Language is not special. Only the evolving increased control of the oral facial region, the motor production of language is special. So remember, this harks back to Chomsky's important observation that aspects of competence and comprehension are in the human mind brain and are shared by the species. And there's variability on the surface production mm -hmm. of language form, uh, but that there are uh, discrete competences involved in the uh, competence of language versus the performance of language. And these are theorists that put all their eggs into the performance production of language. Language is in special, the mode of production is special. Our ability to produce speech is special. So let's look at deaf children. There is no sound, there is no maturation of the oral facial region. So the prediction is that these children did not babble, yeah. not hit that developmental, maybe they'll share first word milestone with a hearing child, but they certainly won't babble on the hands and sign language. Mm -hmm. And what um, we found is that's exactly what happens. Profoundly deaf children exposed to sign language produce homologous behavior to babbling. It's not just similar. In fact, it's utterly fascinating. It's the human, so in, think of what the brain's doing. In the human brain of a child, they are reaching and grasping and doing non-linguistic activities with their hands. Out of this, the human brain mind carves out a discrete set of behaviors that are unique linguistics. So the power of language and to produce language is so powerful that the human brain can even carve out hand language from hand gesture in the single child. And so um, the definition of babbling is that of the range of phonetic inventory that the child hears in their ambient vocal language, spoken language, they only select a core subset of units that they combine, but in ways that are not in the ambient world, in novel combinations, and that have no meaning or reference. It's almost as if the child is um, entered some uh, tantalizing, intriguing stage of human development where they're practicing language. And that's exactly what we see in sign, signing children. Of the ambient hand forms that they see, both in gesture and in their native sign language, they extract out a small set of the phonetic hand phonetic units that make up all the signs of their native language to come. They produce it in um, uh, reduplicative patterns in ways that don't match anything in the input, go beyond the input, and they mean them without, they use them without meaning or reference, almost as if they're in a stage of practicing human language. So that showed us that aspects of the patterning of human language are absolutely key, not the capacity to produce speech or sound. That's very fascinating, many interesting insights. And, and then also moving towards sort of the neural representation in the human brain, which is another huge uh, uh, topic that you worked on. Um, okay, so following from the babbling work that aspects of the patterning of human language was being pushed out onto the hands, yep. that led 
to a bold hypothesis, mm -hmm. a daring and audacious hypothesis. It led to the hypothesis that perhaps aspects of the human brain that we thought were dedicated to the processing of speech and sound were not dedicated exclusively to speech and sound, but were dedicated to aspects of the patterning of human language. That it wasn't speech or sound that distinct that was distinctive and distinguish us from other species, but it's the patterning that distinguish what we do with speech or sound, what we do with the hands, what we do at the nucleus, the patterning of human language that makes us distinctively human and language distinctive. And so that led to the very uh, outrageous hypothesis that maybe the same brain tissue would govern the use of the hands in sign language and the tongue in speech. And this, to stack the deck against us, we went to the very component of human language that once again was universally regarded as the exclusive bastion for the processing of sound. And that was our human ability to process phonology. Mm -hmm. uh, let me just help everyone. Uh, one of the powerful components of human language pointed out by Chomsky is the paradox of natural language, that it's formed from a highly specific restricted set of elementary units that are meaningless, like these little bits of sound that then are combined according to the rules of language that give rise to the potentially infinite set of sentences that we could produce. So we have this incredible paradox. From finite, we get infinity. The, the duality of human language, the paradox of human language. Well, that exists in sign language. Sign languages are made with two articulators external to the body in contrast to one tongue internal to the oral facial region. Yet one of the striking cross-linguistic components of natural sign languages is turning away from the mathematical combinatorial possibilities of having two hands, the brain carves out onto these hands a small restricted set of meaningless units we call them hand primes, from which all the signs and sentences of a natural sign language are created, such that we can go from the finite set of phonetic units, hand sign phonetic units, to the infinite expressive power of natural language. There's nothing that I can express in any of the spoken languages that I speak that I cannot express in sign language nothing. These languages are full-blown languages, naturally evolved. Uh, um, they're made of the same human brain tissue as all languages, and they follow and are the um, window into the brain as to what is central about human language and what's an accidental consequence of the articulators that you happen to be using. Um, and uh, so with regard to phonology, uh, if you are a hearing researcher, a neuroanatomist, a neuroscientist, a cognitive scientist or a cognitive neuroscientist, it was generally assumed that the left hemisphere, uh, particularly a swatch of tissue that is called secondary auditory tissue, a primary auditory tissue with the um, uh, acoustic information coming in um, neuro, uh, uh, through neuroelectrical, neurochemical activity into the uh, Heschel's gyrus, primary or A1, primary auditory tissue, into A2, secondary auditory tissue, the superior temporal gyrus. It has been um, for 125 years, uh, the doctrine, the neuroanatomical doctrine was that that tissue was the unique 
bastion for the processing of sound and the segmentation of sound. And it was, uh, its function was understood to be uh, one of the primary sites where the brain segments the stream of language, speech sounds coming in mm -hmm. and breaks it into uh, segmental units and groups them and categorize them that allow them to be flooded with the beginnings of the interpretation of meaning and semantics and organization and their syntactic role, et cetera. But that a first stop is um, the, the, what's called the superior temporal gyrus, secondary auditory tissue, the superior temporal gyrus, STG, or in particular, a, a highly privi privileged site for the processing of phonological information, the planum temporalis. That these were anatomical structures known to have unique function for speech the processing of phonological information. And so we deliberately stacked the deck against us. We went to the part of net of spoken language that was understood to have discrete dedicated brain tissue. Yep. The universal explanation was for why was that, well, it was auditory tissue. It received its input from the outer ear Heschel's, into Heschel's gyrus, into that tissue. That's it. You have an island. In comes, here's the bridge. Here's the information from the environment. You have your bridge into the secondary auditory tissue. There's no other intervening pathway. Of course, that has to be uniquely dedicated to the processing of sound. So the prediction was that there was absolutely no way that sign languages could use the homologous tissue mm -hmm. it was just considered an absurdity. Mm -hmm. And so we took um, phonological units in sign language and we did a very um, elaborate, sophisticated study on the question. And what we found is the punchline is that uh, the profoundly deaf signers processed the hand units in their native sign languages in the identical brain tissue. Again, this is not an analogy. It's not like north of it or next to it or near the hands and not near the mouth representation on the motor strip. It was in the identical tissue. We had a variety of sophisticated ways to definitively understand where we were in the brain uh, with morphometry studies, voxel by voxel studies to um, ensure that we were actually standing in the identical part of the brain that is was in the as uh, analogous to the hearing controls. And we found that there was not only activation for the phono phonological components of sign in that phonological tissue that was thought to be exclusive to speech, but that we also found that semantic processing, the search and the retrieval for the information about word meanings, mm -hmm. which is called uh, the left inferior frontal cortex, uh, that the LIFC was also the site for the process of processing of semantic information in a totally silent language mm -hmm. that has no sound signature. Mm -hmm. and so these signed languages opened up an entire world of power and discovery about the essential components of natural, of human language. Here was evidence, powerful evidence that the brain isn't discriminating your sound, your sign. Sign language, we're gonna shunt you over to the right side of the brain where we process gesture. No, if your gesture, but your linguistic, we in this tissue are gonna take you and own you and processing you. And that tissue proved to us and the neural systems, it's not just uh, a phrenology localization position. Those neural systems are not dedicated exclusively to the processing of sound. Speech doesn't make us special. Sound doesn't make us special. But the existence of natural sign languages redefined 
the nature of human language and our brains. Our brains are dedicated to aspects of the patterning of language, irrespective of whether it's on the hands in sign language or the tongue in speech. And from the maturation studies, the structure studies, and the brain studies, the human brain demonstrated to us that it doesn't care if you give it the hands in acquisition or the tongue in acquisition, it will out itself onto the hands in language of sign or it will out itself into onto the tongue if you give it the tongue. And if you give it both, it will equally, without discrimination or asynchrony, learn both as effortlessly as a child in a Spanish English home from birth. Mm. Yeah, yeah, no. So um, uh, again, it led to the insight uh, that Chomsky had hypothesized decades earlier there was, uh, at the time, uh, the power of proof in the real world had not yet existed. The, what he did was prophetic. He articulated what the system must have to be in order to achieve human language. He told us the definition of what the target state was. He identified how it was possible for the language to be learned and the logical uh, requirement that the deduction had to be involved in human language. No child could just as a tabla rasa sit there and blankly memorize and learn all the sentences that they'll ever utter mm. in across their lifetime in the first three years of life. And I mentioned first three years because that's a milestone mm. when children, all human children of our species achieve a stability in the basic knowledge of the language. Of course, it's refined over time, but in the basic elements of the language they have now mastered by that age. And in that short period of time, he showed us why it was logically impossible for a child mm -hmm. to have uh, learned all of language in that period, while we had to have basic structural predilections that then get um, uh, for these parameters that then get established, set by virtue of the nature of the structure in the input, and how uh, that can yield the generativity that we see and the creativity that we see in natural language. His hypotheses and his hypothesized methods his hypothesized mechanisms that must exist and his hypothesized um, learning processes that must exist were all extraordinary because they were extraordinarily correct. So we go this 40 year arc with these extraordinarily different types of ways into the human brain, including the among, I believe, the most elegant way in is to go into human language without speech, to test that previously people tested speech was special by studying speech. You can't do that. You have to test the language that is not speech and then compare the maturational processes, the structural achievements, and the brain processes. That trilogy over this 40-year arc taught us that those earlier, earlier hypotheses were essentially correct by Noam Chomsky. Of course, we've advanced and refined the types of mechanisms, and we've um, uh, grown in our understanding and uh, humility to the complexity of the human brain. And we've also uh, achieved an enriched understanding of the contribution of the human brain. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that the new tools of studying the brain permitted us to concretize aspects of uh, the theoretical formations. And to also uh, 
allow us to address some of the naysayers. For example, um, old theories are not thrown out. They're just, they evolve and they get more complex and they change their garb. And, but, you know, the essential elements of learning entirely from the environment and um, aspects of language that become um, uh, entrained because there are patterns in the environment. These sophisticated views, they'll still put patterns and language out in the environment and then they get pressed onto the child's brain. These are nice growth, nice tools that we have to address them and to set some of them aside. I mean, it isn't the case that there's no um, pre-organization of the human brain with regard to language. It's a very silly prima facie example. We will agree that language occurs in our brain and not our big toe. Mm -hmm. But now the question is where in the brain and what are those mechanisms and how do they evolve and what are they contributing? And we have a pretty good handle on that and that's exciting. And we can in a more succinct way and rational way come back and say, no, all aspects of human language are not learned entirely from the environment as Chomsky has said you know, 55 years ago. Um, uh, and he, let's tell, let me tell you why, and let me tell you the evidence that we have, and let me tell you the mechanisms in the brain that are dedicated to, you know, grab that type of information and process it. And let me tell you what happens when those mechanisms aren't involved in the type of compensatory processes and other brain tissues that take over and which other brain tissues can take over and won't and don't. Yeah. What, tells us about the fact that there are dedicated neural substrates in the brain that facilitate us learning language. Yes, we learn language from environmental input, but this modern work in the biological foundations, the neural underpinnings of language, allow us in a more intelligent and sophisticated way to clarify that picture a little bit more. Yes, aspects of language are learned, but some are not, yep. not directly. And here's what the brain is contributing to the organization of the linguistic stream. Here's what the brain is contributing to the detection of the units that we on the outside call phonology. Here's mm -hmm. what the brain's neural substrates are really tuned to and are really searching for in the environmental inputs. Here's why the systems kick-started in the first place because of these brain mechanisms. And here's what we do need from the environment. So it allows us to um, fine grain uh, yep. analysis and fine tune our understanding beyond mm -hmm. just nature nurture we have much more advanced well beyond the pendulum of nature nurture we really do have uh, a rudimentary understanding of what the human species is born with why we're unique in that what's in the environment what's the relationship between learning and the neural substrates that are in a ready state to learn language and to boost direct the child into its cognitive and conceptual world. Mm -hmm. Now, this is very fascinating. And thank you for, uh, you know, uh, uh, running us through decades of uh, work and, and research and, and maybe now uh, sort of moving uh, uh, towards uh, the final question. So more focused on, you know, the work that you've been doing at uh, uh, Gallaudet, um, uh, you know, how that relates to sort of, you know, Chomsky's views, uh, uh, but also maybe more looking towards the future. What does the future hold? What are some exciting uh, areas of research that maybe extend beyond the insights that we've been discussing that would be also amazing to hear? Um, you know, as I said, there was a, a progression, a stepwise progression of questions that uh, lead us, uh, that uh, re result in where we stand today. Earlier it was what was language special? Then it was, well, if it is special, what is special? 
Mm -hmm. Then it was, well, it can't just be that speech is special. We now know that the brain has privileged sites for the processing of the patterns of language. And now we're at the point, now and into the future, we stand at a moment to understand what exactly are the nature of those patterns. Mm -hmm. What are those patterns? What is the brain set to? What is the in that booster rocket that kickstarts the process? What's the triggering mechanism? What's the sensitivity? Uh, one of the things that um, uh, is uh, one of the discoveries, recent discoveries in my own lab that's leading to further analyses is um, we believe that uh, through a very complex series of experiments that um, aspects of the neural tissue uh, that we have traditionally on the outside looking in called the phonological language processing tissue mm -hmm. is not set to sound, but instead is set to highly specific rhythmic undulating patterns of about a hertz and a half. It's going to change over time. That time envelope is going to expand in the first year of life but the child's peak sensitivity to that rhythmic undulating pattern does what? It allows the child, well, let me just step back a minute. I'm speaking and I'm speaking rapidly. If you're a young baby and you don't know English, one of the tasks before you is to be able to just find my words. Where are the beginning and ends of my words? Uh, this even happens to you as an adult. If you're an adult and you're in a country that you don't know the language and you want to ask, someone comes up to you and all they're doing is asking you for a pen, you can't even, your sensation is that they're speaking too quickly and you can't even find the beginning or ends of the meaning. You can't even find the beginning or ends of where the words are. So a baby is faced with the same challenge. It pops out of the womb. It's faced with natural language around it. It has to find the segments from which the words will be built and reference can be solved and the infinite number of sentences can eventually be created. It has to find the words in this ling continuous linguistic stream. So what we have through a variety of experiments, we have discovered that aspects of the brain tissue we thought was dedicated to sound instead is dedicated to highly specific rhythmic undulating patterns, temporal patterns in maximal contrast. And that sensitivity to these chunks, these fall rise chunks, allows the child to break into that linguistic stream and pull out the phonetic syllabic unit from which they can build their words and solve the meaning of reference in the first place. Because mm. you can't know the meaning of ball unless you can find ball in the sentence. So if I say, that's a ball, look at the ball, look at the ball, can you see the ball? What a pretty ball, you're a baby. You have to be able to pull out ball to understand that it's that little round thing that just rolled across the floor. So nature gives the child the sensitivity to highly specific, maximally contrasting, rhythmic, undulating, temporal bursts. And anything that falls in that time window is a candidate for analysis to find the phonetic syllabic unit. You can get a monosyllabic word in there. With that window of, sens of temporal sensitivity, the baby can find the word mm. and can begin to solve the problem of reference, the meaning of words. And so this is the booster rocket into the language acquisition process. It is in concert with other mechanisms that are evolving simultaneously. This is not a stepwise sequence. First, they're interested and sensitive to segmental properties of words, and then they get the meanings, and then mm -hmm. they get... No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. 
children are is highly sensitive to emotional cues. They're sensitive to the um, organization, social organization around them. They're sensitive. Their brain is grouping them mm -hmm. and these segments that are coming in. Mm -hmm, They're yeah. but brain has a sensitivity not so much to sound but to the patterns the patterns at the nucleus of human language mm. this is what this is the concretization the physical instantiation of chomsky's hypothesis that the we are sensitive to the patterns of language and the patterns of language are sensitive are primary here it is the brains from the get-go the brains boost the rocket a trigger that sends the child into language acquisition by being sensitive to what to the patterns of natural language and we've identified one initial nu rhythmic nucleus a bundle of about a hertz and a half however that's going to quickly open and more, more complex and more multimorphemic and complex phrasing and clauses are going to be, and are going to be in that purview, that window over which the child will then do its statistical analyses across the stream. But people who depend very heavily on, oh well, that's easy. The child learns grammar the child learns patterns by listening to the patterns in the environment and through entrainment they're laid down in their brain don't have a mechanism to explain where the child's sensitivity to patterns comes from in the first place what its window of sensitivity is and what part of the brain is doing it again i just want to make sure this is not about taking Chomsky's theories and finding the neural substrate or correlate of them. This is not reductionism. This is a different question. This is not a, because Noam is right. You cannot go from thought to a specific neural process that you can open up and, and say, right there you're thinking of a banana it's impossible that's not the goal here that's not the goal i actually don't know um any neuroscientist or cognitive neuroscientist who has that as the goal what i do know is that's an, a caricature of people who do not know chomsky's theories of his theory and it is an uninformed attack on his theory because he never said that, he never intended that. And those of us who do neural studies, that's not our goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what is the goal is our desire, um, which is a healthy goal in theory building, that when you build a theory that in principle, on the list of criteria that you want it to meet, it one of the entries should be that what you postulate is biologically plausible of the species. That's all this is about. This is not about finding the center in the brain that we that's phonology. No, no, no. It's finding we derive a phonology in the course of acquisition. That's the hypothesis. Is that a biological plausibility? Is that anything the human brain could achieve? Mm -hmm. That point. The point is not to find the swatch in a phonology type way of that's where phonology is. No, we're trying to uncover what of the theoretical hypotheses about the nature of language is biologically plausible and potentially true of the species. Yep. Because you want the theory to be true of child development, of the facts that you see unfold. You want your hypothesis to be true of the nature of the target phenomenon, language. You want your 
hypothesis to be true of maturational development of the species, which means you want your hypothesis to be biologically plausible of the capacity of the species. So that's all these endeavors are setting out to. Nobody's trying to find the swatch of neural tissue that's phrenology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or that's, no, not in a, that's phrenology. Nobody's trying to find the swatch of human tissue. Well, there is phrenology. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sense. I don't know of any um, contemporary cognitive neuroscientist who espouses that. Again, I only have seen um, outsiders who don't know in, in depth the theory that Noam has postulated mm-hmm. are don't know well the neuroscience yeah. agenda and goal and leaping over those multiple disciplines yeah. make caricatures of Noam's position. Um, so uh, shifting to the topic, uh, you know, of your uh, more recent work, so your uh, research at Gallaudet. So maybe uh, it would be great if you could explain a little bit, you know, your research there and how it also relates, sort of, to you know the work that uh, you know Noam Chomsky has uh, put forward himself. Yes, I am at Gallaudet University. I'm a cognitive neuroscience fair in um, at the head scientific director of the Tito Brain and Language Center for Neuroimaging. And um, uh, being at Gallaudet has been one of the most uh, thrilling and powerful experiences of my entire life, uh, unparalleled. Um, In addition to um, the uh, integrity of the the university, um, in addition to having um, uh, among the most brilliant students that I've ever had in my career, uh, the Um, the uh, existence of the language, uh, the people, and deaf culture has been among the most powerful uh, teaching tools for me, uh, learning tools for me in my life. Um, uh, We have uh, understood well that deaf people have their own culture, Mm -hmm. and diversity is um, humbling uh, when you live it and um, through the grace of their inclusion permit my uh, time there. I'm very fortunate that I have been invited into this very, very uh, distinct place. Um, But there's more. Um, Being there has opened my mind to the contributions of um, diversity and the necessity for diversity in science. Mm -hmm. Um, We make so many assumptions that fall out of the modality that we're in. Um, We uh, speak language, but the structure of human language had to pass through constraints of the mouth. Mm-hmm. What if, this is a thought experiment. What if aspects of human language that stems from the brain and driven by the brain as it's coming out of the mouth mm-hmm. got altered, reshaped, that somehow the modality reshaped what mm-hmm. we think is a central part of the brain. So here we are for thousands of years studying the product of what comes out of the mouth, thinking mm-hmm. we're getting into something core about the brain. But what if the aspects of the modality changed that. And so we're picking up artifacts of transmission of the mouth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sign language in stripping away the mouth and, the, and, and sound allowed us to see what about language got pushed out onto the hands. And through looking at that convergence of language from the mouth and language from the hands, those two trajectories of information allow us to converge on what are the essential central properties of language in our mind, which is exactly what Chomsky wanted to know. This is the way we were able to find out this information. But it, so 
this the the modality free properties of human language teach us about the essence of the human species mind that is a gift that we never would have seen if we just looked for the where the quarter dropped under the lamppost we had to strip away sound to see the essence of us and more than that my brain studies at Gallaudet have been eye-opening. There are aspects of my speech brain, my brain that was raised in speech, was attenuated and lost processing capacities that I could have had but because of the switch to this one modality, aspects of my brain attenuated down to a of, to the auditory modality. But when you strip that away and you see what we lost, that gives you a contribution to the neuroplasticity of the human brain and the cognitive and semantic processing of the human brain that are unique and unique to the deaf culture and that we never would have known if deaf scientists weren't participating in this. In this. Deaf scientists, I learned that deaf scientists have to be involved, not to be politically correct, but because their contributions to discovery uh, see things that I don't see. I don't see because it's been attenuated out. I, I hear better or auditory discrimination, but I don't see things. My brain lost that capacity. It was given over, uh, taken over by aspects of my, sound processing, the perspective that my deaf scientists offer to me, allow us as a union to make discoveries about the species that we never could have made before. There can, I, I am now, science should not proceed without diversity all diversity. Science should not proceed without deaf scientists at the helm of, of scientific questions about the nature of the mind contributing right there at the front line because the discoveries we have made about the nature of our species I would have never made if I was out there with only my hearing peers. The, the neuroplasticity of the brain, the brain shift over to the left hemisphere, the wedging open of the brain's lateral capacities through the exposure of visual sign languages. We thought that was a given that the left hemisphere, left hemisphere does the lion's share of the processing of language. Surely the right hemisphere is involved, but that the left hemisphere does the lion's share. We thought that was a biological given. It's not. It happens in ontogeny in early life. If you're exposed to sign languages, those the richness of that visual experience wedges open the brain's process, the dual hemisphere processing capacities, and the brain doesn't shut down and attenuate to the left hemisphere. You use more, you have more, you engage more. These are things we never would have discovered if it wasn't for the participation and the diversity that I was afforded um, at Gallaudet University. No, oh, yeah, that, that's very important. So yeah, thanks for sharing that with us and making that statement. So uh, uh, Professor Petito, this has been, you know, amazing conversation, as I mentioned, like I've learned a lot over the past uh, two hours. So uh, yeah, I really thank you uh, for your time. So do you have any, any parting words? I want to thank you so much. Uh, it's really um, my joy and honor and privilege to be able to share this. Um, we did travel a, a quite a number of years, but I was so happy uh, to have you as my audience member uh, was very engaging and thank you.